Hi, everyone. My name is Stephen Kilger. I'm the managing editor of Feed and Grain. Uh, today, I'm talking with Christy Swoboda, uh, technical service director for Romer Labs. At the end of December last year, Romer Labs and Feeding Grain put on a webinar about mycotoxin trends in 2021. And now Christy is joining us to give us an update on all things mycotoxins and what's changed since that webinar. Hi, Christy. Hello. So can we look back at the 2021 harvest, which is complete now? Can you kind of tell me what you observed? Sure. So when we look back at the 2021 harvest, um, I will say for the most part, the levels of mycotoxin contamination that we observed analytically fell along those more historical lines. You know, so we see low levels of aflatoxin, you know, a fumonisin uh, of Don specifically. Um, and then we see those typical regionalized pockets where we might find some higher contamination levels that are kind of experienced year over year. This year, along with the last couple, we've added an additional focus on okra toxin A and even T2 and HT2 into our, our analytical testing. Those are really driven by some industry partners. Say the, the infant soy-based market has an additional focus for okra toxin, even the, the poultry industry or the pet food industry wanting to drive down some analytical detection limits for T2 and HT2. But, but really, if we just look at the, the crop harvest in general, I'd say nothing news and noteworthy per se. When we talk about kind of regionalized occurrences of mycotoxins, you can think about where in the country we experience more extreme weather patterns. So those extreme patterns are kind of where we find those pockets of maybe, hey, we have more aflatoxin here or oh, we have more Don there. Okay. Per se. So what, what kind of extent do those events really impact mycotoxin? levels. I'm thinking of storms and, and floods and all that kind of, but even extreme heat and things like that, right? Right. So yeah, weather is actually the largest contributor to mycotoxins across the country. So really any weather event, like you just mentioned, you know, be it drought stress, heavy rainfall, maybe, you know, a hurricanes come through, could have tornadoes, you know, or just high winds, hail that falls. Really, any of those weather events that occur on the plant can lead to that plant being under stress. And really, whenever there's stress on the plant, it kind of creates those additional avenues for the, the mycotoxin development to occur. You know, if we just talk about drought, drought stress and if we just talk about the corn crop, you know, it's often brought to mind immediately, oh, let's watch for aflatoxin and oh, let's watch for fumonisin. So if you think kind of year over year, Fumonisin is, is known to occur at some level in the corn crop coming out of the south. When you think about July and August summers in, in the southern U.S., they're hot and dry. So the, the weather, you know, is definitely the largest contributor to that, that mycotoxin development. Were there any specific weather events or trends that you'd like to discuss? Anything that stood out to you? Right. Nothing in particular from 2021. Um, you know, we did have, I believe it was Hurricane Ida came through you know, made, made some in the peanut industry a little nervous for a little while. Luckily, nothing regarding uh, mycotoxins kind of came to fruition there. You know, but with, the, with each of those industries and in each of the different regions, you know, we just year over year know, know what to watch for, um, know where to kind of put our additional focuses and, you know, kind of hope for the best. During our webinar we had at, towards the end of um, 2021, we had several questions about various mycotoxin testing and stuff. One of them was about sampling. Can you kind of give your recommendations on what a good sample is and how to take a good sample? Sure. So when we talk mycotoxin, sampling and sample to sample variability is a topic that we still discuss today, as we could see by the questions coming in, but also is something, you know, we've discussed over the decades. Part of the reason that it continues to remain a focus is that mycotoxins are distributed in a non-homogenous fashion, um, either within the field or within the lot of grain. So if you think about a field of corn or if you think about a rail car or think about a <clears throat> truck, the mycotoxins are going to impact some of the corn kernels potentially or, you know, a different commodity, but they're not going to impact every one of them. So we have to take extra care and be very diligent 
that when we pull samples, that we really pull representative samples to make sure one, um, on an analytical basis, that we don't miss the mycotoxins, in which case we would then underreport a true contamination value. Or, you know, on the, the flip side, we could hit what's called a hot spot and we could find all of the mycotoxins in the sample that we pull. And then at that point, we've we've deemed a load or a lot contaminated when maybe it really isn't as bad as, as that data point says it is. So, you know, time and time again, I, I go back to an old study, but it, it was well designed and it's from the USDA. It goes back to a couple gentlemen, um, Whitaker and Dickin, that did it. You know, there's many new reports, studies, publications, journals, you know, USDA handbook, all of those things that that talk about sampling guides. But through the old USDA study that I talk about, you know, they determined analytically that only 2% of the error in analysis is related to the end method that a consumer detect or selects. That 98% of any error that you get in mycotoxin analysis is associated with the sampling. You know, and if we think about it, just to walk through it, if we assume a lot is like 50,000 kgs, you know, mm-hmm. we need to take that 50,000 kg sample and come up with a two kilogram sample to submit for testing. So how well do we pull from little spots out of 50,000 kg to get our two? And then once we get our two kilograms, we're going to put it through a mill, we're going to grind it, we're going to homogenize it, and then we're ultimately going to take 10 to 50 grams from that Mm -hmm. for our analytical method. You know, so we're starting with something around 50,000 kg and we're ending up with maybe 10 grams for testing. So you can just kind of assume in in the scale down of that you know, analytically where things can go wrong in that sample. You know, even the USDA handbook or USDA guidebook on mycotoxin sampling, they reference pulling like a thousand gram um, on the low end to maybe a 10 pound sample on the high end. And mm-hmm. again, you're, you're taking a thousand grams to 10 pounds and you're trying to make 10 grams out of it. So, so sampling is, to me, one of the most critical things that we have to be attentive to, to really understand the, the true and the accurate mycotoxin contamination level in anything. Excellent. Yeah, I've, I've noticed over the years that even, what, well, when I think of sampling, I think of truck probes and how it's mm-hmm. gone from do one probe and then grind it and call it good to now they do multiple probes. Do you have any kind of suggestions on that? Right. How- no, and that that's very accurate. Years and, and decades gone by was statement to, oh, just collect a coffee can. Give me a coffee can sample. You kind of envision somebody just scooping a coffee can off the top or out of the bottom of the truck. And and then we've learned over the years that, oh, we missed this or, oh, we hit that and that's not right. So, yeah, definitely taking a multi-probe approach is best. If we're trying to collect two kilograms, let's maybe pull a half a kilogram from four spots or a quarter kilogram from eight spots and let's get the top of the truck, the middle of the truck, the bottom of the truck, same with a rail car or or that sort of thing. And if we're pulling sample from a moving, either an auger system or our production line, the same thing, not to take it just at a single point in time, but to try and collect a subsample over the full time that 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 unit is running to try and get that representative result there. Yeah, excellent. So once the sample is kind of taken, can you kind of speak to the particle size requirements, best protocols, that kind of thing? Yes, because in mycotoxins, particle size does matter, which is a bit different from some of the other industries that even Romer operates in. But when we talk about particle size, what we recommend to customers who are either using a test kit at their facility or that are sending samples in, say, to a contract lab, is you want to get that sample, say, of corn down to a corn flour consistency. We don't want corn grits. We don't want cracked corn. We don't want to see any any chunks of that corn remaining. So get it all the way down to corn flour. The USDA handbook even recommends that you want 60% to pass through a 20 mesh sieve. So they're really pushing the corn flour breakdown as well. And that pushing the particle size small just increases our opportunity to get that sample homogenous because if it's better ground, we can mix it better. And then we get that the better analytical result that we're looking for. 
Yeah, yeah. That makes sense to me. After the webinar, there were several questions that you answered regarding method detection limits. Now, I am a layman and a journalist, and I have no idea what that is. So <laughs> can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. So um, I've actually spent a decent amount of time just this week on this topic, customers. But when when we talk about detection limits and we talk about analytical methods, a test kit or a reference method, we talk about the lowest limit of mycotoxins that we can find. What's the amount that we can find and what's the amount that we can then quantitate out of that? I'll, I'll reference back to that USDA guidebook again. I think they do a, a good job. And then we look at their, their test kit certification program and they talk about, say, aflatoxin at 5 ppb. They want to know they want to make sure that every every test kit, every analytical method at least can detect 5 ppb of AFLA. If you can, great. If you can't, find a way to improve your method. We talk about looking for DON around a 0.5 ppm, fumonacin the same, ochratoxin down to 5 ppb. So they're, they're fairly low, low levels of contamination that we're looking for. Aflatoxins and ochratoxins um, and even xeralinone, we focus in the the parts per billion, where Don and Fumonacin, we believe animals have a little more, not resistance to, but a tolerance, a little more tolerance mm -hmm. to. Um, so we're often looking at parts per million of those. But industry, both in the manufacturing industries, as well as in the academic industry, continue to push requests for limits of detection lower. Not, not saying we're chasing that analytical zero, you know, because we'll never get there. There will always be some level that we can detect. But, you know, like like uh, aflatoxin, for example, you know, Fumonacin talks about five parts per billion. Analytically, we have methods where we can look down to one part per billion. Can we see 0.5? Can we see 0.1? Just the more we understand impact from a toxicity standpoint or from a synergistic toxicity standpoint of what mycotoxins do to humans and animals, kind of the lower we continue to push these, these detection limits of interest. So along with that, of course, the lower we push the detection limits means the increased probability that we're finding mycotoxins, but we're finding it at very low levels. So then you have to weigh into that conversation. What does that analytical data mean? And what do I do with it now that I can detect something at these lower levels? Yeah. So even though we're there's more hits, right? It's just percentages we weren't able to really detect earlier. Correct. Correct. Very valid. Excellent. Uh, so is there a difference between, say, a rapid test kit you would get uh, from a company like Romer and reference methods? Right. In mycotoxins, the majority of the rapid test kits that are on the market are based upon reference methods. Mm -hmm. So if we look at a lateral flow device or mycotoxins, the data that was generated as part of the validation package for that test kit included testing by HPLC or by LCMSMS. So there is a very good correlation within the mycotoxin industry when it comes to, especially in grains, if I run a corn sample, can I get a similar result on my water-based lateral flow device at the probe station? And can I get a very similar result coming out of a, a contract lab for an LC MSMS result? I mean, the answer is yes. When it comes to those raw grains, um, test kits um, are very good. They're very well suited. They have a, a strong applicability in the marketplace. Um, so there you see very similar results. Now, where I'll caution customers is the more complex the matrix is, okay. or especially the more complex a feed or food product is, the less likely it is that you're going to find that good linearity. So test kits um, struggle with complex samples. So when mm. we think maybe corn byproducts, we think pelleted animal feed, if we think feeding silages or TMRs or mixed rations or things like that, they're a very complex sample. They're going to have a lot of pigments, a lot of colorations. They could have oil content and things like that in there. So I, I would just caution the further away from a simple grain we get, the higher the probability is that to really get an accurate result, we need to be using a reference method to do that. That makes sense. I mean... 
That's why you probe your grain at the start. Right, right. To know know the levels going into your product for sure. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of chatter about risk assessment happened in the webinar. Um, can you provide some thoughts regarding regarding industry performed risk risk assessments? Correct. It, it has been something that's been chattered about for a while. I think it's it's graining, not graining, gaining traction more as we focus on branding or as we focus on compliance regulations, things like that. There's no one size fits all answer when it comes mm-hmm. to a risk assessment. So if companies approach us with where should we be testing, how many samples we should be pulling, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? We can't give them those answers. We can give them our thoughts on okay, we've seen aflatoxin in corn from the upper Midwest, or, oh, we see fumonacin in corn from the southern U.S., or, you know, things like that. But knowing your region that you operate in, or at least the region where you're pulling your grain from, and then in that region, understanding what levels are seen and what levels are out there is really kind of step one to the risk assessment. So if you've not been testing or if you test the, if you test on more of a um, surveillance manner, you know my first recommendation would be to increase testing. Maybe do a, a vendor survey or a crop survey or an incoming grain survey or or just something to really understand what are we taking in, what do we have going on, and from there then you can start to work through how many samples we should be pulling, deciding for yourself at what point and at what focus you put on testing grains coming in, testing products in progress, and then testing finished products as well. From my point of view, I think you have to be testing for mycotoxins at all points. You know, I don't think testing just on the front end is enough because something can get through. The same if you're light on testing on the front end and more heavy on the back end, you're taking up producer's risk in, in that regard. So, it's really the the quality team and the the management team sitting down and working through what, how much risk they're willing to to take at what levels to feel comfortable that they really have mycotoxins under control. And at what point can you kind of draw that la- line in the sand and say, as long as we're doing this, we're doing everything in our power to to keep it under control. Especially with traceability being such a big issue right now. I mean, yes. they're gonna. They're going to track that back to you one way or another. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then those those risk assessments, you know, they'll, they'll have to look different depending upon the mycotoxin you're interested in. I'm going to look at aflatoxin and corn different than I'm going to look at fumonacin and rice, for example, because fumonacin and rice is not very common, but aflatoxin and corn is very common. Plus, along with the recipes, you know, that we're producing, how much of what grain is going into our product and and so you really have to get into those details and, and, and that minutia of activities to really get a good handle on on what you need to do. It sounds more in, intimidating than it is, I'm sure, yep. because over the last even my eight years or so in the industry now, I mean, your rapid tests and things have really advanced and are easier to use than ever and better quality than ever. And so you yes. can really set something up. <laughs> Yep. And I agree with that because, um, you know, I've I've been working in mycotoxins for a little over 19 years myself. And I started in an analytical lab 20 years ago. We were doing corn testing in a lab by HPLC because that was kind of the gold standard and that's what everybody did. And then over the years, as test kits really became more available, you know, USDA certification programs or AOAC approval programs got gained better traction. Then we started seeing customers take that corn testing to their facilities, and then we start testing more the the feed products or the complex corn byproducts or things that test kits can't handle. And, you know, 10 years ago, test kits were even solvent-based. We were selling to to customers, but they were needing to use acetonitrile water or a methanol water, a hazardous solvent that they then had to dispose of when those test kits, well, you know, the last few years... Test kits have now transitioned to water-based extraction, you know, so it's safer that for their employees, safer on the environment, all of those things. So I agree as, as we continue to push the boundaries on analytical capabilities and ease of use for the customers, the industry and, and where we test and how we monitor continues to evolve. Uh, excellent. I am, 
I'm sure you guys will continue to evolve as the years go on too. Don't worry, you you'll have the mixed products down eventually. You'll be able to eventually. <laughs> eventually, I agree. I agree. Someday. Uh, so those are all the questions I have. Do you have any uh, closing thoughts? I guess the main thing is that you know the, there'll always be mycotoxins. You know, they're as we stated, they're driven by weather weather patterns. Currently, there's nothing that can be done once there's contamination in a grain to remove it. Can't process it out of there. We can't get it out of there. You know, so if it's there, the industry to continue to work to divert it applicable channels to for human food, pet food, you know, animal feed purposes. But so it, it's always going to be there. And and I think regulatory means will continue to tighten. I think we'll push those limits lower or, or add additional mycotoxins. You know, yeah. regulation currently is focused on aflatoxin. There's guidance on Don and Fumonacin. But, you know, I mentioned we do a lot of zeralinone testing, but zeralinone is currently not a regulated toxin. Same mm-hmm. with T2 and HD2. So, I think there's things that there that'll continue to, to drive the industry. And, and some of that's just as the, the research furthers, the understanding furthers, develops on truly herd health aspects mm-hmm. and the impact of these toxins, even at very low levels on animals or in levels, you know, synergistic effects. I think as we understand more there, it helps to guide the industry. And then we can can throw in the topics of emerging mycotoxins as well. Mycotoxins have been known for hundreds of years, can go back to some of the early plague events and hypothesize that mycotoxins played a role. So, but even oh, wow. with that, you know, we're still discovering new mycotoxins or, or understanding the impact of new mycotoxins, you know, on the herd health as well. That's great to know. I, I didn't know yep. about the, the the plague possible origins. Yep, yep. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, mycotoxins are what byproducts of mold, right? So mold's yes. always been here and always will be. That's right. <laughs> we can That's right. About and, and, that. Yep, yep. And in this particular case, yeah, mold and the metabolism of the mold making them the mycotoxins definitely problematic. But like you said, mold's always been around, and some molds, such as penicillins, you know, proven to be a very good thing for us. And, and plus, I mean, testing for all that stuff, I mean, it's nice to be ahead of the regulatory process yes. sometimes. <laughs> yes, I agree. I agree. And it adds a nice value add to your product as well. Yes. Um, yes. Well, thank you so much for talking to me today. I really appreciate uh, you stopping by and uh, having a chat about mycotoxins and what they're what they're doing out there. Uh, thanks for everyone who is listening. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and make sure you check out that webinar if you haven't yet and stay tuned for any content. All right. Bye, Christy. All right. Thank you, Stephen.